morning. First off, I'd like to ask you a question. How many of you actually like law, the court system, or lawyers? <laughs> no hands up? I do. My wife is a lawyer. I like oh. law. <laughs> Sensible man up there. Okay. And that is part of the problem. Okay. Everybody dislikes law or dislikes lawyers in the law until they are required. And then people come to me, we didn't know. What are we meant to do? And I say to them, just like Paul was delivering the same message, you need to be involved in the first place. Aquaculture is actually an industry that can learn from the mistakes of others. You've got the opportunity to develop your own regulations, to be involved in a lot of the discussions about the laws and the regulations that are going to affect you. When we talk about the future, I flew over from a very long way, lots of water between Australia and Europe, and I had a lot of time to think about what that environment might look like in 20 years' time. Is it going to be so overcrowded as what we've seen on land? Is it going to be managed better? And this is where we have the opportunity to make that change. However, in order to understand where our current ocean governance and policy comes from, it is also very important to understand the past. Up until recently, the entire ocean policy has been from the founding father, that's not me up there, it wasn't a bad hair day. Um, that is actually, oh, because you can't see it yet. Um, that is Hugh Brutus, who was the founder of the first ocean policy. He had the idea that there was freedom of the sea that it should be open and exploited by every nation and every person. 1600s. It's taken until recently for us to decide that may not be a good idea. It may need to be managed a little bit better. However, the marine environment, and particularly the offshore agriculture environment, <coughs> is very crowded. You've seen by the graphs that have been presented by Paul and Jose, the fact that there is shipping, there is also traditional commercial fishing, there is the new area of blue technology, the use of the ocean for production of energy. And then one thing that doesn't get a greater dimension very often is tourism. Okay? There is going to be conflict between tourist industry, also non-government organisations. There's been a number of challenges by NGOs to offshore development. And those are currently getting hearings. And whilst they're getting hearings, most of the time there's a win for the agriculturists, but the problem is the cost. Okay? Each time there is a challenge to your development, it is a cost to that development. So if we can get the framework right, we can also make sure that cost is reduced. Now, we've already heard partly about this, um, the law of the sea. I just want to expand on that slightly and give you a more overview about how complex the legal environment is and about the concept of jurisdiction. So, the two main factors of the law of the sea and international environmental law, which was a lot of the conventions Paul was talking about. Now, the law of the sea was established to have a, you know, nice, peaceful use of the resources. Okay? It was developed with fishing in mind. And this is one of the other key things I would like you to think about, is whether aquaculture now needs to move itself away from fishing, okay? The commercial fishing 
idea. Okay. In Australia, in South Australia, they have actually brought in legislation, laws and regulations specifically for aquaculture. It has been removed from the fisheries management and given its own. Similarly, Perth and WA are looking at similar laws and legislation. Now, when we are thinking about, however, the international regime, hopefully it won't end up like this cartoon where we have a grab for the resources. Most of the offshore will <coughs> aquaculture will occur within the area we call the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone, or if you're from America, the EEZ. In terms of the Exclusive Economic Zone, it is 20, sorry, 200 nautical miles from the baseline. That's a lot of water. Okay. Um, it is within the LOCOS, or the Law of the Sea Convention, the Exclusive Economic Zone talks about fishing. Nothing to do with the Law of the Sea was about environmental protection. It was about resource allocation. So they decided that you have three nautical miles, which is your territorial sea. Um, interestingly, they came up with three nautical miles, going back to my good mate Hugo, because that was how far a cannonball could be shot. So they said that was how far you could protect your jurisdiction. Within that territorial sea, the state or the coastal state law applies. So your pollution laws apply from your country within those three nautical miles. It becomes interesting when you come out from those, okay, because now you have a mix of domestic and international law. Within the exclusive economic zone, you can construct, operate installations in accordance with what we call Article 56. Now, in terms of what's allowed, the simple answer is yes, you can establish those large offshore cages within Article 60 and 56. So, that allows you to develop. However, it doesn't mean that it is developed without any regulation. <laughs> there are further articles within the law of the sea that do have some environmental controls, particularly articles 118 and articles 192. In terms of articles 118, it means that states must ensure that their practice of offshore aquaculture does not threaten wild stocks. In terms of Article 100... Not too good with um, Articles 192, it can also be seen that in, when you are establishing offshore aquaculture, it's very important that you also establish laws in relation to pollution. Okay. Pollution does not know boundaries. It doesn't say, oops, I'm Italian pollution, I'm stopping here. Okay. It flows on through. That may mean your next door neighbour might not be too happy. Okay. So it is important that the development take into account what are going to be the controls. How are they going to be managed? The other important things to consider and to think about are also, once you're in the exclusive economic zone, what employment laws are going to apply? Okay, Because there's nothing in the law of the sea about that. Thailand recently, a few fish farms there, were found to have unfair practices. There are also other international laws affecting the development of aquaculture. Um, we have, and Paul's gone through a number of these, um, biodiversity, 
The problem is, up until now, aquaculture and fishing, as I said before, have been put together. I think it's very important that that stop in terms of a future development and legal regulation. There is also things, marine strategy frameworks, birds and habitat directories. Okay, there are many things that need to be considered and that will impact on your business. Okay. The important thing is to understand that you need to engage, you need to think about what the future holds, but also for business, one of the key things I find is the fact that many businesses not understanding the law is actually one of the biggest risks to your business. For government, the failure to actually put in laws that work. I do a lot of work with Pacific Island nations, and as you saw from Paul's slide, they actually have the largest EEZs in the world, if you combine the Pacific Island nations. Okay. They have put in place some great laws in relation to illegal fishing. Tuvalu, one of the smallest nations, has put in the fact that you cannot fish unless you have a licence. And all these penalties, that's fantastic, they don't have a navy. So the enforcement of all of that is pointless. It's not just putting the laws on paper, but it's also about thinking how they are going to work, and that's where you need that input. The important thing is not to let this opportunity get away. Okay? Aquaculture is on the rise, it will, as we've seen, it is overtaking commercial fishing and will be the future. But it's important that industry has a voice in that future and governments understand how that industry works. Thank you for your time.